It's taken me 30 years of study without myself being a CIA officer to try to understand how the CIA operates. You have to read dozens and dozens of books. I mean, it, it takes years of study to understand how the CIA operates. So it's virtually impossible to explain it in a few minutes. But they do. The CIA is organized in a couple of, you know, in a particular way that allows it to um, uh, do the things that it does. First of all, it's, it, it operates outside the laws of the United States. The Congress has given the CIA the right to commit crimes in foreign countries and also not to be prosecuted for those crimes in the United States. So the, the entire judicial system in the United States has been structured to allow the CIA to do these things. It's not that the, you know, a lot of people frequently refer to the CIA as somehow being a rogue agency or doing things without approval. But the CIA, everything it does is approved by Congress and the executive and the Supreme Court. It has the complete backing of the three branches of the United States government. No other, no law enforcement branch in the United States including the FBI, can prosecute the CIA for any crimes that it has committed. So you have to understand where what the CIA's mandate is. It is given a mandate to do these things. It is allowed to do these things. You just can't know about the things that it does. And it's wrapped in secrecy. And the first two criteria that the CIA follows is that when it considers launching an operation, that operation has to meet two criteria. First of all, it has to have some intelligence potential. It has to be, you know, be, provide substance to the CIA's uh, mill. You know, it has to, it has to have some, some potential to, to do something that's of importance to the CIA. The second criteria, it has to be absolutely deniable. If it, it can never be found out or discovered. So the CIA doesn't do, do anything unless it can deny it. And how it goes about denying and structuring its operations so that they are deniable is like the first thing that you have to understand. And it does it through its relationships with all the other branches of government in the United States. The CIA, uh, CIA officers do not walk around presenting themselves to people overseas as CIA officers. They present themselves as State Department officers or military officers or as private businessmen. They all operate undercover so that everything that they do is deniable. And of course, the captains of the media industry, all the major publishers, all the major editors, all the major correspondents are aware of this and they go along with it because you have to keep it secret. I'm Doug Valentine, and I'm the author of a book titled The CIA as Organized Crime, How Illegal Operations Corrupt America and the World. The CIA created the Phoenix Program in South Vietnam in the summer of 1967. Um, some senior CIA officers were asked to create a, uh, by the White House to create a general staff for pacification to handle the pacification of, of South Vietnam. The military was handling, was taking care of the main force war, but the CIA and the White House felt that they needed to attack what was called the Viet Cong infrastructure. The managers of the uh, insurgency, the civilians who were, were um, giving political direction to the insurgents in South Vietnam, these people were civilians. So the, it was, um, the, the CIA was given the job because the military, by law, is not allowed to target civilians. 
the CIA got the job for creating and managing the CIA program, the, the Phoenix program, because it was targeting the civilian leadership of the insurgency in South Vietnam, and it was felt in order to win the war, uh, those people uh, had to be what was called neutralized. So the Phoenix program was set up to go after those people. There were already about 25 programs in place, uh, some of them run by the military, some of them run by the CIA, many of them being run by the South Vietnamese police and um, uh, military, which were already targeting this group of civilians as part of just traditional military intelligence work and CIA work. What the Phoenix program did was set up a center in Saigon centers in every uh, core, at every uh, province, in every province, and in every district. These were called intelligence uh, uh, operations coordinating centers, IOCs, which were part of this, emanating from this Phoenix Center in, in South Vietnam. And each one of these centers at the district, province, core, and national level coordinated these 25 um, uh, programs and agencies that were already involved so that it, it became a concerted effort uh, under the direction of the CIA. There were, um, Phoenixes had two tiers. Uh, the upper level tier, tier, which was the real concern of the CIA, was to target the leadership of the Viet Cong insurgency. These were leaders. So using standard intelligence programs um, uh, informants, interrogations, uh, um, largely, and as well as you know, electronic intercepts. The CIA, through the Phoenix program and all the programs it coordinated, set out to identify, first of all, who the leaders of the insurgency were. And its first goal was to turn these people into double agents, to recruit them in place so that they would then spy become spies within the insurgency and tell the CIA, well, what the, what the plans and goals of the insurgency were so they would know ahead of the time, so they would know where they were going to launch a strike or a, a paramilitary operation or where they had agent nets. Um, the, the Viet Cong had agent nets inside all throughout the government, and they wanted to, to find out where these agent nets were. So at the very highest level, it was an intelligence operation designed to identify and penetrate these intelligence operations that the Viet Cong were running. But, and there's a long way and many stages from that, going from that very top level down to the villages where the Viet Cong also had operations and agent nets set up. So at the same time that they were trying to identify the leaders, they were also trying to identify the agents of the insurgency who were inside the villages at the very vi at the village, the very bottom level. And this was something that was um, just as important, but it's at the very far end of that spectrum. And at that level, um, in, in order to, uh, once agents had been identified in a, in a, at the village level, if that village was, if those people existed in a village that was in enemy controlled territory, then the Phoenix people would call in a B-52 to bomb them, and they would just bomb that village. Or they would send in assassination teams that were paramilitary CIA assassination teams that would um, sneak into the village at night and assassinate these people. It was you know, dangerous stuff to do because it was in en enemy territory. And in the process of doing that, they, the CIA and the military also waged psychological warfare against these villages in which um, uh, uh, all sorts of terrible things occurred, but, but largely they, they tried through propaganda and psychological operations to convince the villagers not to support these agents in the villages. And that basically amounted to terrifying anybody who supported the Viet Cong. Uh, and it was uh, open season on anybody who was suspected of s supporting the Viet Cong. So at the very basic level, bottom level, at the village, the idea was to terrify people through the Phoenix program and make them not support these agents at the, at the ground level. At the top level, the top tier, the idea was to keep 
these people in place, to keep the agent networks in place so that they could be penetrated and so that the CIA would know what their plans and objectives were. And, and in that sense, they were actually keeping the Viet Cong insurgency in place. So at the top, the top level goal directly contradicted the very bottom level goal. But it was rationalized on the point of view that, you know, I mean, the senior level people were important people, whereas the villagers were non-entities and it was okay to, to slaughter and terrify them. So My Lai wasn't an aberration. I mean, this kind of thing, the wholesale murdering of entire villages was part of the Phoenix program and also was it part of the Army's program? Well, like I said, all these things were already in place. I mean, these things were already being done before Phoenix was set up. The military certainly wanted to know, had, certainly had agents in enemy villages because they wanted to know when the insurgents were going to stage an attack. And that's what the mil tactical military intelligence is designed to determine where the enemy is and where they're going to be so that you can launch an attack against them. And if they thought that a village contained enemy soldiers, well, then it would turn into me lie. They would just send in a couple of companies of men and they would wipe out everybody in that village. Or they would send, um, uh, you know, uh, a B-52 or bombers to just bomb the village, which was often the way that they had done it. But by 1967, when the Phoenix program was, in, was instituted, they had realized that these kinds of really horrific wiping out everybody in the village operations were doing nothing to win the hearts of the minds of the villagers to support the government. So Phoenix was implemented as a way to, whenever possible, bypass these kind of large military um, uh, operations that, that you know, utterly destroyed villages, and they tried to terrorize them on a more psychological basis, a more psychological warfare basis. They would bring them into interrogation centers. They would prevent them from getting jobs. Uh, you know, they would... Uh, um, there's just a million different ways to, to terrorize people, just like people in the United States are oftentimes afraid to get involved in political action because they're afraid if their bosses know, they'll lose their job. So it's the same thing. The CIA could tell somebody, you know, who worked at a school, well, you know, this guy supports the Viet Cong. Now you're fired, now you've got no job, now you're poor. You know, so there's just a million ways to terrorize people. And uh, they did them all. And it was, that's what the, the Phoenix program was designed to do. But again, at the upper tier level, it was designed to keep the agent nets and the agents the, and the managers in place so that they could be penetrated, uh, their operations could be penetrated and so that they, they could be turned into secret agents themselves. I had written a book about my father's experiences in World War II called The Hotel Talk Loban. I had always wanted to write a book, and that book was successfully written and published in, in 1984. And after that, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I went and I started helping a friend build a house in New Hampshire. And while I was helping him build the house, one of the other guys that was helping out was a Vietnam veteran. He'd be an army ranger. And uh, he made a crack to me, oh, so you're one of those writers that'll, that's only going to write one book. And I, I was offended by that, and I thought, well, okay, I'll write a second book, and then people can't say that anymore. And I didn't know what I wanted to write about, but I decided to write a, about the, the Vietnam War. And because my father, the book about my father involved a military secret and something that was kept secret, I wanted to write about a part of the Vietnam War that nobody had written about before that was considered secret. And so I went to the, a local VA hospital in um, New Hampshire, and I asked the director of the, the VA center of this VA hospital if there was a part of the, the Vietnam War that nobody had written about and that was very, very secret. And he said, yeah, the Phoenix program. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, there's a guy here who was in special forces who's a resident, permanent resident of the hospital, and he was in the Phoenix program, and I'll get him to talk to you. And anyway, so I, a couple of days went by, and, and he called me up, and he said, this, the guy won't talk to you. He's afraid that if he talks to you about the Phoenix program, 
he'll lose his VA benefits. And that just spurred me to think, well, why would an American soldier who's been obviously, you know, damaged by his service for the country be afraid about talking about what he did? And that got me interested in the Phoenix program. And I started reading up about it. And I learned right away that William Colby, who was a former director of the CIA, had been the individual most closely associated with the Phoenix program. Colby had run the program in Vietnam for a couple of years, and he had testified to Congress in 1970 and 1971 about the Phoenix program. And he had um, been very kind in his, in his words about the Phoenix program. So not being a, um, a academic and not being someone who had come up through the traditional uh, journalistic uh, career path, I sent a copy of my book, The Hotel Talk Loven, to Colby and asked him if he'd give me an interview about the Phoenix program. And to my surprise, he called up on the phone and said, yeah, come on down, let's talk. And uh, uh, first I met him in his law office in Washington, D.C., and that was in 1984. And I outlined what I wanted to do, and he agreed. And then later on I met him again at his home in Georgetown, and we did uh, uh, a taped interview. And Colby liked my idea. I told him I wanted to demythify the Phoenix program, and I wanted to write about it as a bureaucratic program. And he liked that approach. And um, he said he would help me, and he would introduce me. And he started introducing me to some of the senior CIA officers that had managed the, senior, the Phoenix program and the, and the programs that it coordinated. And to my surprise, Pretty soon I was knee-deep in CIA officers who were telling me everything that was previously classified about the Phoenix program because Colby had sent me to him. And, you know, that just started a, the ball rolling. William Colby had been a, um, in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, in World War II. He had parachuted into France behind enemy lines um, and... Uh, created an agent that worked with the French resistance. One of his comrades from the OSS, a guy named Evan Parker, who was um, uh, served in Burma uh, uh, in World War II uh, in a different capacity. Parker had been an interrogator in Burma with the OSS in World War II, had been a close friend of, of uh, Colby's. And so when the Phoenix program was created, Colby arranged for this fellow, Evan Parker, to become the first senior director of the Phoenix program. He, Parker ran the uh, Phoenix directorate in Saigon starting in July of 1967. Parker and Colby had both entered the CIA when it was created. They had worked together at that point for 20 years. They were very close friends, and Colby wanted a trusted you know, person, someone he could trust in the, in the position of... of um, uh, Phoenix director. And so he appointed, arranged for Parker to get the job. And I knew that Parker had been first the first director, and I said to Colby, can you set me up with an interview with Parker? And he said, yeah. And he called up Evan Parker, and he said, well, you know, I'm going to send this guy, Doug Valentine, over to, to talk to you, and would you please talk to him? So that, that happened very early, and it was one of the first interviews I did. Parker was living in, I think, Rockville, Maryland at the time. And uh, I went down to see him. We arranged a time, you know, and he had this nice suburban house. Nothing special, you know, but a nice house, well-appointed. He had recently had a stroke. He was kind of avuncular, uh, tall, tall, I'm six feet tall. He was probably an inch taller than me. Um, Fair-skinned, nice-looking guy, thinning hair. Um, and uh, he invited me indoors, and we went up to his study, which was on the second floor, where he had a lot of books about Welch poetry and poetry. And, and I had been um, uh, an English lit student in college, and I had studied uh, a little bit about Welch poetry. And, and Parker and I just sat there in his study for an hour and just talked about poetry and things that were related to Welch history and stuff like that. And 
and he got very comfortable with me. Um, he liked the way I looked, a, a, a very waspy looking, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, very courteous. I was wearing a, you know, a nice suit and tie. And uh, um, after talking for about an hour, he said, I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to make us some tea and uh, bring up some cookies. I'll be back in about 15 minutes. And there was a little coffee table in between us, and on that coffee table was a bunch of documents, which I had sort of been eyeballing the entire time that we were talking, and I was certainly aware that it was there. And uh, Parker said, so I'll be back in about 15 minutes. And he winked, and he went downstairs, and I opened the top document that was sitting on that coffee table, and it was a roster of all the people who were in the original Phoenix Directory. Uh, all the pil military people by name and rank, and of course the CIA people were civilians, and it just had, there was about 45 names, 40 or 45 names, and I just furiously wrote them down in my my notebook with any kind of uh, uh, data that identified them. And about 15 minutes later, Parker yelled from downstairs, Doug, the tea's ready, I'm coming up. And so I... I uh, you know, put my notebook away and closed that, closed his file and just sat back and he came up with a big smile on his face and put the tea and, and cookies down and, and we just continued, started talking about Phoenix. So when I got home, I immediately started, and this is like 1984, 85, trying to find, to locate these people. So there were military stud books which I could use, but mostly ended up in the library just going through um, the phone books and looking for the names and seeing if I could find people. And one of the people I found was a guy named, um, oh God, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but I contacted him. He'd been in the original Phoenix Directorate. He was an army colonel at the time. And he said, you don't want to talk to me. You know, I can tell you certain things about the Phoenix program, but the guy you want to talk to is Tali Akampur. Um, full name, Tullius, Tullius Akampur, who had been also a World War II veteran and was a very senior at that time CIA advisor who worked with people um, uh, in the Phoenix program. In fact, the office that Evan Parker moved into when the Phoenix program was created was an office that had been occupied by Tully Akampura. So Parker had pushed Akampura out of his office and, and Tully's office had been uh, involved in the same kind of operations that the Phoenix program was involved in. So, so Fe Tully had felt kind of displaced by the Phoenix program and um, uh, he was sort of a lifelong enemy of Colby and uh, Parker. He'd been in the CIA since the Korean War. He'd served in the, um, uh, for the CIA for many years in Italy from 1958 until 1965. And when he was assigned to Vietnam in 1966, he became an advisor to a man named General Nguyen Luan. And Luan was the head of both the South, Viet South Vietnamese Central Intelligence Organization, its CIA, its military security service, and its national police force. So Tully knew everybody across the board. He knew all the major S Vietnamese players, and he knew how they felt about the Phoenix program. And Tully was a person who was like a counter counterpoint to everything that Colby and Parker said to me. He was the person that I would go to and I'd say, so what really happened, Tully? And Tully would tell me what the Vietnamese were thinking. He introduced me to uh, senior Vietnamese officials who'd been involved in their branch of the, the Phoenix program. And I got the, a whole different perspective from Tully. And he became, you know, really the person that was uh, my rabbi, the person that I could trust for honest answers about what the CIA was really doing. And so... How did his story differ from Colby and Parker? Well, in a lot of ways. I mean, it didn't have any of the gloss 
you really have to get into the details of reading the Phoenix Program book in order to see what he was saying and how and how what he would say would 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 uh, uh, expand on what they were saying and 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 for example the um, uh, when the CIA created the Phoenix Program the Vietnamese objected to it I mean they thought it was going to that the CIA was going to use it against them, members of the South Vietnamese government, okay? They saw it as a threat to their national sovereignty. And the CIA implemented the Phoenix program over the objections of the senior South Vietnamese police officials, like, like this guy at Luan. I mean, they did not want it. They, they did not want the CIA being that deeply involved in espionage, and intelligence operations, which they were, they had been involved with for decades, and which they had set up themselves, and so uh, they resented uh, the CIA taking over all these operations and telling them what to do. But the CIA went ahead, and it implemented the the, the Phoenix program over the objections of these people. And Tully Akampora explained to me why that was, and he also introduced me to. Um, uh, the guy who read, ran was the director of the South Vietnamese special branch of the police, which was the, the branch of the South Vietnamese government that was most deeply involved in Phoenix, a guy named Nguyen Mao. And Tali introduced me to Mao, and I had a lot of conversations with Mao, and Mao explained to me the Vietnamese perspective and what the Vietnamese were thinking about the Phoenix program, which in many cases contradicted directly the propaganda and the public affairs statements that the CIA and the Americans were making about Phoenix. So I was able to get tremendous insights. And, and at the same time that I was interviewing all these CIA officers, you have to remember they were giving me, in many cases, the company line. And I would then talk to Tully and I would go back and I would do a second interview with them and I would say, but what about this? What about that? What about this? And they would be wondering, well, how did this, you know, how do you know about that? But they would have to answer honestly. And that's, how, you know, so I got a rat-a-tat going. And a lot of that was due to uh, Tully having some resentments, having a lot of resentments about the, we the way the CIA conducted itself in South Vietnam and the way it ran roughshod over the sensibilities of the South Vietnamese, including the senior South Vietnamese uh, uh, police officers. I didn't them. follow the traditional path of a, of a person who's going to make a, a career out of being in the, in the media. I didn't go to um, Columbia Journalism School, School of Journalism. or you know, I, I wasn't an academic who, who taught. I, I was a, a guy who came out of nowhere and Coldy liked me and started introducing me to the senior CIA people who eventually thought that I was a CIA officer myself, but Colby had sent me, and, and so they told me their secrets. A traditional journalist takes somebody like Morley Safer, who was a major correspondent in Vietnam. He would know who, the, who senior CIA officers are in South Vietnam, and he would go talk with them the New York Times would arrange for, for a guy like Safer to go talk to um, uh, a senior CIA officer on background, off the books. And, and he would tell this guy Safer what the CIA was generally up to and what it was generally doing. And then that would help this guy Safer put his stories into context. But he would never mention the name of a CIA officer. He would never reveal the name, that a CIA operation was ongoing. But in order to do the job and report about the, the war in accordance with the objectives of the Pentagon and the CIA, he would have to have certain amount of information in order to know what not to say and when to talk about what he was not supposed to say in the proper way. And, and, and so that's how it basically works. That's how it still works today. Um, uh, any major correspondent in, in um, Iraq or Afghanistan has known 
the CIA officers that are working there for 10, 20 years. They've, they've known these, they all came up together. And they all work as, you know, um, Americans who are united for the American way and to achieve American goals, which, of course, in, a, in our capitalist society, and you can't distinguish our capitalist society from the goals of the CIA and the military in terms of its imperial objectives. It's, you know, the objectives of the, the New York Times are the same as the CIA and the military when it comes to furthering America's capitalist goals of a, uh, creating, an imperial, creating an empire. No matter if they periodically may criticize the methods or, or you know, some things that are happening, they have that same overall goal, and they're both, and the media and the, and the CIA and the military are all united in trying to achieve those goals. They have, there's nothing that distinguishes them. Well, when I was um, uh, interviewing CIA officers, uh, I interviewed some pretty interesting people. Um, uh, Colby actually arranged for me to interview a guy named Frank Scotton. Frank Scotton was the United States Information Service, and he went, which is the propaganda branch branch of the United States uh, State Department. It's the uh, the branch of the government that preaches the American line. They're the ones that come up with the words that are supposed to be used in order to try and bring uh, uh, citizens of foreign countries in a line an alignment with American goals and objectives. And Scotton was sent to Vietnam, South Vietnam in 1961. And he worked for a guy who was very closely involved with William Colby. And Scotton's job was setting up what were called armed propaganda teams. He would go into, he was working with the CIA very closely a couple of people told me he was actually in the CIA. And he was working with the paramilitary branches of the South Vietnamese police and military services. And they wanted to get the American point of view, the American line. They wanted to preach it to people who were in enemy territory. I was telling you earlier about villagers who supported the Viet Cong. So they would identify a village that supported the Viet Cong. And Scotton's job was to create a team, a paramilitary team of soldiers, many of which who were listed as having deserted from the South Vietnamese Army and were actually had contracts with the CIA, um, guerrilla warfare. And they would be security for a team that would go into a village that was controlled by the enemy. And they would have with them agents of the United States Information Service. And they would you know, go in, take over the village for a day, kill any of the Viet Cong that were there, gather all the, the villagers together, and they would give them a sermon about why the United States government was, um, why, the, why these villagers should support, should support the United States government and the government of South Vietnam instead of instead of um, uh, the Viet Cong. This is what the CIA does all over the world. Even now, they create little units like this, which are designed to try to speak to people in, at the village level and um, convince them to support the United States. Terrorism, terrorizing these people, is a, is a big tool that they use. That was Scotton's job. By 1965, Scotton's program, this armed propaganda team program that he had piloted for the CIA starting in 1961-62, had become, gone nationwide. It was being used by the CIA in every district, in every province in South Vietnam. They bureaucratized it, they standardized it, and they created a, a training center in Vung Tau, where they started training people how to do this, to perform these functions. 
One of the people that started working with Frank Scott in 1965 was Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg was involved in this program of armed propaganda teams. In fact, he was sent to Vietnam by the um, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, a guy named McNaughton, specifically to say how the military could be integrated into the, the CIA program. And so Colby sends me to Scotton to understand this. And Scotton starts, to, you know, is telling me the whole story, which is described in detail in the Phoenix Program book and, as well, and, and also in the CIA as organized crime. And in the process of Scott and telling me about this, he says, and by the way, I lived with Dan Ellsberg for a year. He was my roommate. Dan was involved in all this. And in 1966, Ellsberg was one of the people that worked with me in writing up what was called the Roles and Missions Study, which explained how the military could become directly involved in these kind of psychological warfare operations at the village level. Now, when Daniel Ellsberg wrote his autobiography, he didn't mention any of that. When the movie was made about Daniel Ellsberg, his involvement in this program was not mentioned. So I felt it incumbent upon myself to write about that. And um, through Peter Dale Scott, um, who a lot of you people may know, um, very famous writer who writes about the CIA and drug smuggling like I do. I asked Peter Dale Scott about Ellsberg, and he said to me, well, Dan's my very best friend. And he set up, Peter Dale Scott set me up with an interview with Ellsberg. And I asked Ellsberg about everything that Frank Scott had told me. And basically, Ellsberg said, yeah, sure, it's all true. And he, and he elaborated on it to some extent. But the thing you have to know is that until I wrote about Ellsberg, until Colby introduced me to Scott, nobody else had ever written about that aspect of Dan Ellsberg's life. And again, it goes back to some people feel it's their patriotic duty to keep the CIA secrets. And Ellsberg was one of those people. One of the people that I wound up speaking with, one of the CIA officers was a very famous CIA officer named Lucien Conin, a good friend of Tully Akampor's. They had known each other for years. Um, uh, Conin had also been in the OSS with Colby. Conin had parachuted into France like Colby had. Only Conin had dealt with the Corsican Mafia when he was in France. And um, uh, Conin had maintained relations with the, with the Corsicans throughout his, Corsican drug, smugg drug smugglers throughout his career. Lou Conin was um, one of the original Americans uh, working for the CIA who went to, C to Vietnam, to South Vietnam. He was there when, before Vietnam was partitioned in 1954. And he was there uh, after the partition in 1955, doing these kind of paramilitary operations that I told you that Scotton was involved in, these kind of uh, propaganda psychological warfare operations. When Daniel Ellsberg arrived in South Vietnam in 1965 to work with Frank Scotton in, in this armed propaganda program, one of the people that he also worked with was Lou Conine. And Lou Conine, Frank Scott, and Daniel Ellsberg were very good friends. And uh, uh, Ellsberg was known as, a, as a, what was called in those days a swordsman. He was always having romantic involvements with South Vietnamese women. Um, and one of the women he got involved with was a woman named Germain. Germain was three parts Vietnamese, one part French. And um, uh, um, Ellsberg got in a, in a romantic entanglement with this woman, despite the fact that Germain's boyfriend was a guy named Michel Seguin. And now Michel Seguin 
was a Corsican drug smuggler in South Vietnam. Both Scotton and Lou Conine told me that Michelle Swig Seguin tried to kill Daniel Ellsberg out of in a jealous rage because Ellsberg was romancing his girlfriend's remain, and that um, uh, Conine and 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 Scotton each separately told me how they had to uh, intervene with the Corsican gangsters in order to to uh, prevent this assassination from going on, from occurring. And I, when I talked with Dan, I asked him about it. I said, so, you know, is it true? And he said, well, it, it's true that Michelle Seguin came to my villa and put a gun to my head and um, told me that he was going to kill me if I didn't stop seeing Germain. But he denied that either Scott and or Lou Conine had anything to do in preventing the Corsican drug smugglers from killing him. And when I asked Dan if Conine or the CIA or any of his friends were involved with drug trafficking in any way, he flat out said no, which is directly contradicted by the facts of the matter. And um, anybody who wants to get into the, the real facts of the matter can read... Al McCoy's book, The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, in which uh, McCoy documents a conversation that he had with Lou Conine, in which Conine told him that in 1965, at the same time he was hanging out with Ellsberg and Scotton, he brokered a truce with the major Corsican drug smugglers in Saigon. So we know for a fact that Conine was dealing with Corsican drug smugglers. He had throughout his career, but Dan denies it. So, you know, it's just, for me, it was just more evidence that Dan Ellsberg has a loyalty to his all CIA comrades and, and would do nothing to implicate them either in these armed propaganda teams, which were basically terrorism, terrorizing the villages, or in drug smuggling, and that, in my my opinion, that um, uh, calls into question his motives and other things, everything else that he said. I could be wrong, but that's just my personal opinion. When the CIA wanted to create a compatible left in France after World War II, one of the things it did was hire a group of Corsican drug smugglers the Guarini family in Marseille to bust up communist strikes in Marseille. The CIA gave, through a you know, black bag money, hired these Corsican drug smugglers in their, to shellac the strikers so that, so that the, the, they act basically hired gangsters to destroy the Communist Party in France and also in Italy, where, of course, during World War II, the CIA was intimately involved with the mafia in, um, after World War II when the, the OSS wanted, was um, the forerunner to the CIA wanted to take over political control of Sicily and arrange for all these mafia guys to become mayors. They all worked with the CIA and it had relations with um, uh, underworld traffickers. The CIA has uh, uh, intimate relations with underworld traffickers here, drug traffickers here in the United States. When the CIA wanted to overthrow Cuba, it hired Santo Traficante, who was the, uh, the biggest drug trafficker in the mafia in the United States at the time, to try to arrange the assassination of Fidel Castro. That's the CIA working with the, most, the, the biggest Ameri drug trafficker in the United States, allowing drugs to come into the United States for the single purpose of trying to knock off Fidel Castro. I mean, that's a fact. It's, it, it, and in doing that, it suborned the leadership of the Bureau, Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which had no choice but to go along with it. It absolutely subverted law enfor the entire law enforcement branch of the United States government, federal drug law enforcement, and it has been doing that since its inception. When the CIA decided to fight a war in Laos, it actually it created a secret army uh, of um, uh, 
Montagnard warriors under a general named Vang Pao. CIA allowed this guy Vang Pao to traffic in narcotics in exchange for offering up his tribe's people to fight this secret war. The CIA allowed the top generals and politicians in South Vietnam and Laos to traffic and make fortunes in narcotics in order to advance the political and economic interests of the United States government. So narcotic trafficking is one example. CIA has its, its hand in every kind of illegal operation that's being conducted in, in foreign countries all around the world. Arms trafficking, illegal arms trafficking, it happens every place where illegal drug trafficking goes on, and the CIA has its hand in it up until the point that it's actually managing it. Mexico is a great example of that. It's been going on in Mexico for 70 years. In order to destabilize the Mexican government, CIA arranges for guns to be smuggled into different various factions and for drugs to be smuggled out. Everybody knows this. It's a fact. And that's why I call the CIA the organized crime branch, in a few words, of the United States government. It, and that is also why everything is done is secret. And it's another reason why all the major media outlets and reporters and editors and, and, and uh, publishers in this country protect the CIA because it would absolutely destroy the illusion that the United States is a force for good and that it's the bright shining light of the world. If people knew what the CIA was doing, they would understand that the, the United States wages war crimes as policy, that it's involved in, in crime all over the world, managing crime all over the world. And it would completely, I mean, it would be like suddenly exposing to, to all the Catholics that there is no God. You know, I mean, and there, it would just turn the United States upside down if people do really understood just how evil its leadership is and how it affects its, its really evil uh, plans and objectives secretly through the CIA. A, a very important person in understanding the CIA was a man named Phil Agee. Phil Agee had been a CIA officer for many years and um, uh, he actually wrote a book about his experiences in the CIA, which is absolutely required reading if you're going to understand the CIA. Read Phil Agee's book. Agee called the CIA capitalism's invisible army, CIA. And that was the term that he used. If anybody could be said to run the CIA, you know, it would be the major industrialists in the United States, the major financial institutions, um, Wall Street uh, investment firms uh, very have a lot of influence uh, over the CIA, uh, the petrochemical industry. Perhaps the, one of the major influences over the CIA is the arms industry, Lockheed Martin, uh, all the, the people who create and build uh, aircraft carriers, warplanes, the whole arms industry. It's a boondoggle for the imperialism. Capitalism is a boondoggle for the 1%. And nowadays you have to include the uh, uh, high-tech industries, uh, software, uh, computer companies. I mean... A very small percentage of our population is making billions and billions of dollars out of um, uh, uh, American capitalism and imperialism. And, and, and if anybody could be said to run the CIA, it's those people uh, in their totality. It's an idea. It's an ideal. It's a belief that Mother Earth and our planet is something to be raped and robbed and stolen from and that the people of the planet are inherently useless and, and worthless 
and that they're just there for us to be to be exploited. Anybody who has those ideas, no matter what your whatever level you're at in the economic part, you know, scale in the United States, if you believe those things, then then you're running, you're helping to run the CIA, and you're supporting it in its sabotage and subversion of sovereign nations all around the world who in many cases really want to respect the planet and um, implement public po policies that are humane. The Phoenix program can be seen as, as um, uh, a bureaucratic way of organizing systems, um, the, just, the justice system, the um, uh, health care system, all the different systems that, that go into making a country. The Phoenix program is a way of coordinating all these various systems and bringing them under political control so that certain political objectives and economic objectives can be met. And of course, it's, it combines essentially the, um, uh, the police and the military with civic organizations in order to identify people who are considered um, uh, people who can't be assimilated ideologically into the into the systems that we're we're trying to that are trying to be defended okay and I noticed after immediately after nine eleven the first thing that Bush did. President George Bush at the time, was to create an Office of Homeland Security. And the Office of Homeland Security was going to create in every state um, uh, a center that would bring together police forces with military, the, what was called NORTHCOM, the, the branch of the military that's involved in, a, in, in uh uh, policing, in a sense, um, North America, the, the branch of the military that operates here domestically, with um, uh, uh, the FBI and, and every other law enforcement um, uh, and paramilitary and civic organization in, in specific centers around the country for the specific purpose of identifying potential terrorists. And this was exactly the bureaucratic system that the CIA set up in South Vietnam through the Phoenix program. And I describe it in excruciating detail in a whole bunch of, whole bunch of I described it in, a, in detail in a, in a bunch of articles I wrote right after 9-11 um, uh, called The Politics of Terror, uh, um, The Phoenix Returns, It Comes Home to Roost. There was a whole bunch of articles which I then which were consolidated in my latest book, The CIA as, an or as Organized Crime, which described how the Phoenix program, it's, as a bureaucratic system, was the model for the Department of Homeland Security and how American citizens themselves are, are now, since 9-11, being treated the same way the citizens of South Vietnam were treated during the Vietnam War as potential sources of information about terrorism and terrorists and how they have to be propagandized and how they have to be controlled through really the systematic control of information to make them good citizens who support capitalism, the imperial goals of the United States, the foreign wars that the United States fought, fights. If you're against the war in Afghanistan or if you're against the war in, in, in Iraq, all of a sudden now you become a potential terrorist or somebody who's supporting terrorism and your name goes into a, um, um, a computer that's kept in the, in the local Department of Homeland uh, office in whatever state you live in and all that information about you is gathered in your, and a file is constructed on you if you're, if you're trying to, um, uh, if you're, an activist in the environmental movement, or if you're in Veterans for Peace, you sure as hell are going to find your name 
on a target target list of a potential terrorist supporter in um, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and you you basically sacrifice your right to par- to privacy. So any any citizen now who, in even the smallest way, objects or demonstrate objects to stated policies here in the United States of. Uh, you know, especially in, 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 as they regard the war on terror, fighting against terrorists in countries around the world, you become a, a terrorist surrogate, and you can be spied upon, and all sorts of terrible things can be done to you, not least of which is, is you know, you're subject to surveillance and, and even intimidation in all sorts of ways. Um, and that's what's happening here in the United States, and a lot of people are either on the left, on both the left and the right, are aware of it, that, that a lot of our civil liberties are being curtailed in the name of the war on terror. And it's really just psychological warfare techniques that were developed in South Vietnam during the, South Viet- during the war by guys like Frank Scott and these armed propaganda teams, um, the interrogation centers, the Phoenix Intelligence and Operation Coordinating Centers, all these things have been bureaucratized and and that bureaucratic system has now been applied here in the United States. Tell me how Operation Jade Helm fits into this plan to manage the population here. Well, Jade Helm was an example of the core of, for the first time, coordinating the military and the police services and the intelligence services here in the United States under the um, supposition that uh, for, the, for the specific goal of preventing a, putting down a counterinsurgency. Never before has it even been thought of that there might be a counterinsurgency here in the United States. Counterinsurgency against what? through Jade Helm as a training exercise to show police forces how to work with the military uh, in order to develop informants uh, within civic society, civil society, and how to, how to be able to uh, suppress civilians who are forming militias and, um, or organizing in any way against the federal government. America is a militaristic society. After World War II, veterans who came back to the United States were quite glad to no longer be part of the military. They had seen horrible things, and they were satisfied to, to march in the Memorial Day Parade. But they really wanted nothing to do with the military. There hadn't really been a standing military in the United States prior to World War II. But after World War II, the United States found itself controlling, basically operating occupation governments in a lot of countries overseas. The United States had an occupation government in Italy. It had an occupation government in Germany. It had an occupation government in Japan. And suddenly the United States military was spread all around the world. And with the advent of the war, the Cold War, and the fight against the Soviet Union, it expanded all those military bases overseas under the aegis of the fighting a war against um, communism. The United States ha- now has, I don't know, 750 military bases around the world. And um, uh, it, the military budget takes up the huge part of our the American budget, um, 50% or something like that. A huge amount of money is expended to the military and supporting these military bases. And um, a lot of jobs in the United States depend on the military. People, It's a vast, big employer, not only people serving in the military, but the arms industry and the support industry. So since World War II, the United States has become absolutely militarized, and, and um, the military is venerated and, um, in ways that it never was before. And especially since 9-11, the military has become involved less so in, in standard, traditional, conventional military operations 
as it has become in, involved in waging counterinsurgencies in foreign countries. For the first time since 9-11, most American soldiers are now involved in counterinsurgency operations. They, they operate in small units. They invade the homes of private citizens in foreign countries, and they perform overseas what is basically a police function. And when these veterans return to the United States, many of them join the police forces or become involved in law enforcement, or federal law enforcement. And um, they bring the expertise that they have learned in counterinsurgency operations back here to the United States. And, and the military having such huge influence over civil society is able to persuade local law enforcement to arm itself the same way that soldiers are armed overseas. And uh, with, the, with the, whole, the whole process and the, and, the, and the bureaucracy now just has created this, this same attitude towards civilian society here in the United States as a potential enemy. Mm -hmm.